something that separates you from God right now. If there is, you can ask forgiveness today. If it's sin, you can repent of it today, right in this moment, and you can have a clean slate before God. Wow.
we come to you in the name of your son Jesus, the one who died on the cross, the only one who was capable of paying the penalty of sin. He's the only perfect person that's ever walked on this earth, and certainly he was God in the flesh, God with us, as you said in the scriptures, Lord, and we know, Father, he was given to us as that perfect sacrifice to pay the penalty for all sin. Lord, we can't imagine. We walk around with shame and guilt from our past and shame in the present and the trouble that we live through. We, we suffer things in life and we carry things around with us probably that we shouldn't, but God, he carried the weight of the world around with him. And especially on the cross, the weight of all sin of all time for all people rested upon his shoulders. Lord, as he gave his life, he said, it is finished. Praise you, God, that that is finished, and we have forgiveness. We come to you confessing our faults, confessing our sin, and asking your forgiveness this morning, God. And we want a clean break. We want a, a new start today. I pray that through taking the elements of communion, we realize this is not just a ritual Lord, it's a time when we can truly start over. I pray that we would do that this morning. Father, bless in our time of communion together. Thank you for the sacrifice of Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
tells us that on the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Scripture tells us that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's bow our heads together. Father, thank you for your love and your mercy that you've shown us through Christ. There's no doubt that, Lord, you you had this plan before the foundation of the world. You knew where we were going to be, what we would need, and you, through the death of Christ on the cross, through the giving of his life, you secured salvation for all of us. We thank you for that, Lord, for his broken body and his shed blood today. We celebrate this new start in life, this clean slate that we now have. And we praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> Stand in your presence Until my knees will I fall 
can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine. Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus. We just praise you, Lord, that we have the hope of heaven. And that this life is not all there is. Lord, we have a place that's being prepared for us that we can't even imagine what it's going to look like, what it's going to be like. We don't know how we're going to look or what we're going to be and what we're going to do. But Lord, we'll be satisfied finally being in the presence of the one that died for us. Being in your presence, God. We thank you for that blessed hope that it gives us strength to get through this life. God, I praise you for the plan you have for us. Lord, I pray that everyone listening to my voice right now knows Jesus Christ and has a place being prepared for them as well. God, we praise you for the wonderful plan you have for us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 You be seated. Thank you. 
second by second, minute by minute, because with you, that's the only way I'm going to get through, you know, and if we'll just learn by that and live by that to take one day at a time and let God guide us, let him show us, he'll help us through it. We bring a lot of the overwhelmingness on ourselves because we take it on, but you know what? God, he wants us to put that on his shoulders. That's right. That's right. He wants to take care of that for us. So let's remember that maybe that's something we can take throughout this whole week and just remember that we're going to live one day at a time Amen. and just ask him to show us the way. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Glad everybody's here this morning. And uh, we have, uh, we bought a car and um, it's given us this signal um, that we don't understand. We're, we're driving down the road and all of a sudden it says malfunction. And there's three different malfunctions going on. It's according to the car. And I'm driving and reading on the screen at the same time. That's probably not a good idea. That's probably the malfunction. It's me. But it says uh, there's nothing, something is wrong with the system that tells you whether you're staying in your lane or not. Because it shows a picture. And that's what I'm getting, Jerry. I, I don't know. i got to read the manual and find it. And so uh, it's, it's got that picture. And then the other picture was, um, ah, what's the other picture? Yeah, I was going to do that one last. What's, it, what's the other one? The, the excavation and the triangle. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of what the other one is. We're uh, something else we should probably remember and be scared about. But the last one, it's, it has two cars in like this. And I'm wondering, I don't see any cars around, but <laughs> it's warning me of something. And so I need to read the owner's manual to figure that out because I may be in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes we go through life like that, don't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we just ignore the warning signs and we don't know where our manual is and we may not even know where to find it, but when we look in there, we're not even sure which page it is. We look at the index and we just, we just stumble around so much. When God has got something specific to teach us, He's got his guidance out there to show us the way like the song said and, and like our car is not doing. And, you know, we, we have all these things that God has given us. And that's what the scripture is going to talk about today. And I want to encourage you today that you don't have to be in this life and be living this life alone. That's not what God created you for. He created you and he sent Christ so you have a relationship with him. And it's a living relationship it's not, uh, I'm glad God didn't take up text messaging. I think that's a little impersonal. I think it's a little impersonal even for a phone call. I, you know, we don't have this physical presence of God, but what we do have is this internal presence of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how much more close we could get other than having God living in us. I mean, he's moved in. If you read in John, you read it close. It's not just the Holy Spirit that lives in us. It's God the Father and God the Son. He said, we're going to all make our abode in the believer. Amen. And so read that, and you understand, it's, it could seem like it's pretty crowded in there, but it's God is just in the right place. we got to listen to him, don't we? Yes, and we've got to pay attention to the warnings he gives us. That part has uh, something to do with uh, the message, and I guess that's why our car malfunctioned, because... We live this lot in a world full of trouble and trial and mess. And if we're not careful and we ignore the signs that God is giving us, we're going to be in trouble. We might have a collision or we might get out of the lane, if you know what I mean. We, ought to get, we might get off that path that's narrow and the path that leads us to eternal life. So we're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 1. You're going to be really excited about this. It's only three verses. And you know me when I preach on only three verses. It's really quick. And really to the point, and I don't beat around the bush at all. That's why you have this long introduction. So just taking up a little of the hour that I'm going to preach. So um, 
So uh, last Sunday, we talked, it was Mother's Day, and I hope that you, the, you moms had a nice rest of the Mother's Day. And what I hope is that you followed the, the guidelines that I gave you. What did I tell you to do last week? Anybody know? Four words. Actually, okay, I don't want to confuse you. We were reading out of Matthew chapter 5, and it's let your light shine. I hope you did that this week. Because it's important that your children, especially for your children, to, that they see your light shine. And so, you know, I talked about how it's a great opportunity. It's an amazing opportunity to have children. It's an incredible responsibility to diligently teach your children. And I talked about the word um, influence and how you can be an active influence and a passive influence. And I pray that you have influenced your children for Christ this week and that you'll continue to do that for the rest of their life. That's what they need to see in you is Christ. Then a couple of weeks ago, I know you're going to remember this, and we talked about breakthroughs. And I made the statement that you've already experienced, if you're saved this morning, you've already experienced the greatest breakthrough that you're ever going to experience your entire life. And it's that breakthrough of meeting Christ and moving from darkness to life, from death to life, and being part of the family of God. So you've already had that experience. And if you're here today and you're saved, you should have at one point, if not today, you should ask the question, okay, I'm saved, what's next? And so we're going to talk about the answer to that question this morning. What's next? And I'm just going to give the answer now and save some time. Next is called spiritual growth. God expects us to grow. He's, it's like the farmer that plants the seed in the ground and does the watering and the fertilizing, does all that he can do. He expects some growth. He expects some fruit. And that's what we're going to talk about that. And so spiritual growth is the next step. So we're, and I'm just going to say this because it's true. Um, we're in the last days. Did you know that? We've been in the last days for a while. You know, a hundred years ago, if somebody was standing behind a pulpit like this, at Buttons, I guess it's Buttons Chapel then, uh, so they were probably saying, hey, we're in the last days, or they probably preached that at some point. And we are in the last days. Does anybody know how many more days you've got on the earth? Okay, I rest my case. You, we could be in the last days in that way. Or do you know when Jesus is going to come back, when the rapture is going to take place? Anybody know? Anybody got a vote for September 18th? That's what I'm reading on the internet. It's probably not true. That's <laughs> not true. So you don't know that, right? So it could be today. And so we are in the last days. And something else about the last days that I've never thought about, Brian, is this. If we're in the last days today, and tomorrow we talk about the last days, it's a day shorter. The last days are a day shorter. In fact, the last days are getting fewer and fewer as every day goes by, right? And so if, if 100 years ago somebody was preaching about the last days, they were correct. But now we're even closer. We're 100 years closer. And tomorrow we're going to be a day closer. And next year we'll be a year closer. And so you understand how math works and how the calendar goes. So we are in the last days. And so uh, I, I think as a church and as individuals, we need to catch our second wind. You know how you get tired and you kind of... You're moving slow, and you don't know if you can take another step, and then something happens that you catch your second wind. Anybody experienced that besides me? Uh, I do that when I'm running a marathon, Hunter. Uh, he's no, no, I don't. Yeah, I'm not going to run a marathon. But we do walk, and sometimes I get to where my legs get all wiggly and wobbly, and I guess my blood sugar's down. But at some point, if I keep going, I'll get that second wind, and I'll be okay. And I'll, make, I'll actually make it to the car. See, how we walk is kind of cool. We park at one end of the park, and we walk this track that loops around and comes back to the car. If we want to go home, we got to walk the whole way. <laughs> There's maybe a couple of places you can do a shortcut, but once you pass that, you got to go the whole way to get back to the car. We talked about the other day how the, the, our car is a little bit smaller than the one we had before. And so I think the sidewalk is about the right size. I asked her to go get the car and drive down the sidewalk and get me. She wouldn't do it. But uh, that's an option. So we, we are, we're, in this, uh, we're in this place on earth and we're uh, in the last days. And they're getting shorter and shorter. 
I believe we need to catch our second wind. We need to have a renewed sense of purpose individually and in the church. I think if you have a renewed sense of purpose individually, then the church will have a renewed sense of purpose right. corporately. Right. And we need to have a renewed commitment to that purpose. Okay, so a renewed sense of purpose. Why are we here? What does God expect of us? And then a renewed commitment. I'm going to commit to do all that God says. I'm going to commit to work for the Lord. Right? And so that's what the church needs. And I think this happens. This purpose and commitment come together when we seek spiritual growth on a personal level. And that's what we're going to be talking about the next few weeks. So if that's your favorite topic, you can look forward to the sermons coming up. If, you, if that's not your favorite topic, you have to come anyway, and because this is what you need. Sometimes God tells us things we don't want to hear specifically, but we're going to go in and read Scripture and get out of this hole that I just dug for myself. 2 Peter, <laughs> Scripture, 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. Peter is writing to the church, by the way. This is a letter that Peter wrote to the church to save people. He says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So in these verses, I want you to notice really quickly, in these verses, the power of God has given us some things and promised us some things. We're going to talk about what God has given us and what he has promised us in these three verses. It's a packed three verses. First of all, he says he's given to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. But we don't start right there. We start with the first thing that he gave us. Anybody can look at the verses and see if you know what's the first thing it mentions that he gave to us. Grace and peace, right? It's the first words. That's pretty, pretty straightforward, isn't it? He's given us grace. Through his grace, we have peace. Because we've got a personal intimate relationship with Christ because we've given our life to Christ we have peace with God in the spiritual realm that means not everything may be good where uh, where you are not everything may be good in your life there may be some things going on that you're not satisfied with in your life and in this life you're going to have trouble the Bible says if you live for Christ you're also going to have persecution that's the reason I, I want to be a Christian because so I can be persecuted no that's not why but it comes with the territory, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And so in this life, we have struggle. But I want to assure you of something. If you've received Christ, then you have peace with God in the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm is taken care of. Christ paid the penalty for your sin. If you've asked forgiveness, God has forgiven you. If you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're following Him. You are at peace with God, and you can lay down at night with all the struggle and the stress and the worry. You can do like Carol did, easier said than done, by the way. You can do what she said, and you can put all those things aside and give them all to God and rest well. Because you have peace with God. You know that if you don't wake up on this earth, you'll wake up in heaven <coughs> facing Jesus. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Yeah. And so we have this peace. And it's interesting uh, that it does, it's not just for the spiritual realm. So you have peace in the spiritual realm, but it's also in the physical. In this life, we have an inner peace. That's People describe it like that. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7 talk about giving all of our requests to God, just like Carol was talking about before. Uh, uh, but it says, if you do that, you'll have a peace that passes all understanding. A peace that doesn't make sense. That's what I want. I want peace that doesn't make sense. I want peace that seems a little weird. How can you be at peace? Look at all the stuff that's going on around you. I got peace with God. He lives on the inside of me. I'm at peace. Uh, you just wrecked your car because of the warning signs that you didn't know. You know, it ties together with that, right? 
You, your, your house is burning down. You lost a loved one. You're suffering on your job and maybe you lost your job and you don't have money and, and all these things that can go wrong in this life, we can still have peace because of Christ. It's the peace that doesn't make sense. That's the kind of way. So we have peace from God. What's some other things that we have? So if you've given your life to Christ, He has given you new life. It says He's given us all the things that pertain to life and godliness. I want you to think of life and godliness in this way. When it says life, it's talking about the eternal life that Christ died to give you. If you have been brought to life in Christ, because before you were saved, the Bible says you were dead in your sins, your spirit was dead and on the way to hell, right? When Christ came and he brought you out of darkness into light, he gave you life. He gave you eternal life. Eternal life started on that day. Or if you want to get really deep into it, Brother Gary, eternal life really started before I was even created. What didn't it? Because it said he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's how good God's plan is. So we have this eternal life that he gives us. So he gives us life. And he also gives us, and that, that, that's a new life, right? Old things have passed away, all things have become new. What else does he give us? He gives us a new lifestyle. He said he gave us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So the first one, eternal life, is the giving of life. Godliness is the giving of a new lifestyle. You understand what I'm saying? So he, there's an expectation then that now we're going to leave the old life that we had. We're going to start a brand new life spiritually and physically. Our behaviors are going to change and all that kind of stuff. And, and we're given this new life, this life that points us in the direction of godliness. And he's given us everything we need to get there. Right? And so we have new life and we have a new lifestyle. And so these are the things that God has given us. And probably you could pull in a few more things, but I want to move forward here and look at what he's promised us. He's promised us this new us, this new life. That he, you know, he gave us that, but there's a process going on. And I want to talk about that process that these scriptures talk about. And so uh, he's promised us that we are going to be totally transformed. And you can look up many verses about being transformed and becoming new. And, you know, Romans 12, 1 and 2, you know, be not conformed to the world, be transformed and, and all that sort of thing. You know, be, uh, prove what is the good and, and uh, effective will of God and all those verses that we could talk about. He, he has begun a process in us that um, could be described as... Uh, it's not consecration. What's the other word I'm thinking about? You're not much help. <laughs> <laughs> Missed it. So um, it's being set apart. What is it? Sanctification. Thank you. Sorry. All right. So I remembered it finally. So we're being sanctified. We're being set apart. We're being made like Christ. And so there's a process that starts. Listen to what the scripture says. I'm going to go back and read it. Um. Look at the last part of verse 4. That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I want to talk about that for just a minute. He, one of the things he has promised us is escape. But it's really interesting when you think about escape. If, you, if there's a fire, see that sign with the four letter, red letters on it? It's called exit. If there's a fire... Go out that door, or go out that door, or go out that door, and then the following. So you want to get out of the building. You want to escape. Knowing where the door is doesn't do you much good if you're not going to get up out of your seat and go to the door. Right? So when he says he gives us escape from the things of the world, so to speak, we have to do something about it. It's not just, oh, automatically we're going to be, uh, we're going to be inoculated against the infection of the, of the world, you know, and all the, it's not like that. So when he talks about escape, he says that you can escape the corruption. He's given us the promises. He's given us what we need so that we can escape. It's up to us to do the escaping. He's made the route. He's put the sign up. We got to go out the door. Amen. And so we have to do something to escape the corruption of the world. So it's really interesting to look at. 
The power of Christ gives us everything we need to escape corruption that's in the world through lust. And lust is a word that is maligned. It's a, it's a word that's misused. And I don't, I don't want to uh, I don't want to misuse that word anymore. Because I like words. And I, I, I want to, you to understand the full uh, definition of that word. I didn't look it up in the dictionary, but lust is a strong desire. And so does anybody have a strong desire this morning? Raise your hand. Just me. Okay, okay, here we go. You don't want, you say, hey, he's going to do something bad if I raise my hand. So I'm just going to tell you, you could have raised your hand whether your strong desire was for something good or for something bad. And that's why you didn't raise your hand, wasn't it? Because I was going to get to if you did. It wasn't really a, a real question. So, so lust, honestly, I'm just going to be Real straightforward with you. Lust is often thought of as sexual sin, isn't it? Yeah. Immediately. That's what you think of. That's not the only thing going on, guys. There's a lot of other things that can be considered lust. Our goal is to lust after the knowledge of God. Amen. To have a strong desire to know God better. That's where we want to be. So we want lust in our life. We just don't want it to be the wrong kind. And so when you think about escaping the corruption, that puts the negative spin on it, the corruption that's in the world through lust, through strong desire. And that this paints a picture, just stay with me for a second because I'm almost there. It paints a picture of us living in this world and you're not going to believe this. But even though we're saved, we still have strong desires for ungodly things. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on that. I know you do because we're all human. Right. So we have these strong desires for ungodly things being imperfect. And believers, even those that are trying their best to walk for Christ, walk with Christ, believers are faced with ungodly desires. And that's the kind of things that this escape is for, right? He he's given us what we need to escape the ungodly desire the, the desire, the strong desires for ungodly things. So one more thing I'm going to show you. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. James 1, 14 and 15. We think that the devil is tempting us, and I guess in a sense he does tempt us. But let's see what the Bible has to say. It's right there. But each one is tempted when? When he's drawn away by what? His own desires. Wow. So you so it's my fault. Yes, it is. That's why you have the Holy Spirit living in you, and that's why he's giving you a way to escape. You know that the devil knows what your weaknesses are because he's seen your behavior, and he knows what you'll fall for. And he, so he tempts you with those things. He doesn't tempt me with things that are not tempting to me, that I don't have a strong desire for. He tempts me with the ungodly things that I do have a strong desire for. And that's what, when I need to be looking for the escape hatch. I need to be looking for the sign with the four letters on it, right? Because God said there's going to be a way of escape. And you don't have to fall for the devil's tricks, and you don't have to get into sin, right? And listen, let's, let's just read those two verses. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin, uh, and I'm missing my place here, and when sin, when it's full grown, it brings forth death. In other words, it pushes us away from God. Sin separates us from God. We cannot get in. We can't make a habit of getting into our ungodly desires. We need to find the escape. God has given us the escape. We, we've got to look for We've got to walk through that door. But we don't have to fall for the devil's plan to tempt us and trip us up, right? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. That means he'll always do it every time. When we're tempted, every time, this is what God's going to do. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation temptation also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God has promised us escape 
from the lust that's in us and the temptations that are out there in the world, he's, he's giving us an escape from those two things working together to bring forth sin and death in our life, right? And to set, further separate us from him. So this idea of escape, this is one of the things that God has promised us. But it's a promise. What, what's a promise? A promise is, I will do this. Did you get that? I will do this. That means if we hang on to God and we listen to him more than we listen to the voice of the devil, the voice of the world, and if we uh, take the strong, the things of the strongest desires, the desires for ungodly things, we know what those are. If we stay as far away from them as we can and in prayer and Bible study and all those things that we do to stay close to God, if we stay close to God, he'll provide a way of escape and we have to get up, run away from the sin and go through that door. The Bible says the devil will flee from you if you'll, if you'll run away from him, right? So we can't hang around with the devil. So anyway, the, the whole idea of escape, I think you get that. What else has he promised us? He's also promised us that we can be partakers of the divine nature. Now, I don't want you to answer this question out loud, but for the person sitting next to you, how much are they like Jesus? Not very much. I see you going. I see you doing that. Sometimes, not very much. You're exactly right. Sometimes we're just not very much like Jesus. We can have some good days, good moments, but we're just not like him. He's promised that he has made a way for us. He's given all that we need to take on the divine nature of Christ, to be like Jesus. Wouldn't your neighbors be glad if you became more like Jesus? How about at work? You know, if you became more like Jesus, wouldn't that be better? How about at church or the people that uh, that need to be witnessed to? Wouldn't it be great, better to be more like Jesus? How about your family and all the frustrating times with your kids, and especially if you got, I don't want to say it, teenagers. Um, it's frustrating. And we need to be more like Jesus in those situations. He says we, we have this broad statement that we can become partakers of the divine nature, but it's a, it's a gradual process, and eventually we will have the nature of Christ, so to speak, we'll get to heaven. So, so here it is. God's plan for us is that we are we're supposed to be taking on the divine nature of Christ, to become just like Jesus to the extent that we can, right? 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. 1 John 3 Two and three. Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, it's talking about Christ, when we see Christ, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so we stop right there with that verse, and we realize our destiny as believers in Christ, as followers, <laughs> is to become eventually like Christ. We know that's the direction we're heading. And the question is, are we walking, are we moving forward? Or are we standing around wondering what the next thing is when God has told us, I've given you everything you need, go do it. So the last verse says, and everyone who has this hope in him, this hope in Christ, this hope of being like Christ, purifies himself just as Jesus is pure. So in these two things, the escape, and the partaking of the divine nature, these are things that we do. They're things that God has promised, but we have to do them. All right? I think the next time we take communion, if there's somebody here who doesn't want to take communion, we're going to make them take communion. We're going to force it. You know, nobody was forced to take communion today. You did that because you decided that you wanted to. If you partook of that. Think of, of taking in that bread and taking in the grape juice like we did this morning. That's what he's saying. He wants us to be partakers of Christ and his nature and his behaviors. All of that, right? He wants us to be like Christ. So I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to kind of get close to closing here at least. We do not need more of God in our lives. We do not absolutely do not need more of God 
in our lives. Remember what I told you to look in the book of John and see that God the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and God the Son have taken up residence in us already, and we can't have any more of God than we already have. The problem is, they're living in there and they're talking to us and telling us some things to do, and we're ignoring them. That's the problem. We don't need more of God in us. We need to just obey what he's telling us to do. If you're saved and the Holy Spirit has come to live inside of you, that event taking place there, that, that's life-changing if we'll listen to him, if we'll obey him. That's the problem. Now, why do we, in our church services, sometimes we get really quiet? You don't amen the preacher? I don't have to worry about that, but I'm just saying. Some churches are not as open as with their worship as other churches. I, you know, I have to remind myself of that. I, I like to hear y'all clap, but about a third of the way through the song, it gets really quiet. Y'all must be really tired. But anyway, that, that's just a difference in what you want to do. And I, I don't have a problem with that. I saw my mom. My mom was saved. I know she was. And, and uh, I know she took four little kids to church for a long time by herself. And, and she prayed for an unsaved husband that was an alcoholic. And God answered that prayer. And I, I saw the things that he did in her life, and man, I never heard her shout. I never saw her dancing down the aisle at First Baptist Church in Gallatin. That probably was not going to happen anyway. But when, when the preacher would start talking about Jesus and all that he had done, she'd dig into that purse. I told you about the, the, uh, the uh, Kleenex that was in there for like 15 years. <laughs> and no matter what it had on it, she's, she's Wiping the tears, you know, and I know that my mom was saved. I saw it in her life. So it's not just expressing yourself in that way. That, that's not the biggest issue. We don't need any more of God in our lives because we already have him in our life. And I, my question is, when are we as a church going to start obeying God in everything he tells us? When is, when is our relationship with God going to become the most important thing in our life? And I'm talking about me too. I get busy and I, I forget things and, you know, and I'm not as attentive as I need to be. And, you know, we need God in our life. We can't take our next breath without God and we take that so for granted. We had a friend that passed away and Brenda was probably a couple of years younger than you. About a year older, okay, so about about 16, about uh, Carol's age. <laughs> um, Carol's 58, it's third gay for um, But then I had my Uncle Frank, he also passed away this week, just a couple of days later, and he was 93. Mm -hmm. Death can come at any time. And so we, we don't, not knowing how long our life is, we need to get busy, don't we? If you knew that God was coming tomorrow, that Christ was going to return, he's going to rapture the church, if you knew that that was going to take place tomorrow at noon, we probably wouldn't be sitting here unless we were just getting instructions so we could go out and make sure everybody knows, hey, he's coming back. You, before noon tomorrow, you better get things straight back with the Lord. Here's how you do it. We'd be out witnessing, witnessing to our family, to our neighbors. And, and so why aren't we doing that now? And there's, I think we have this sense that we've got forever, I guess. So... We don't need any more of God inside of us to have peace because he's already given us peace through Christ. We don't need more of God in us to win the battle over temptation because God has already given us the way of escape, right? We don't need any more of God in us to become more like Christ, to take on that divine nature, to stop using our mouth to sin, stop sinning with our mind and sinning in our heart, right? Right? Sinning with our ugly attitudes that we have toward people sometimes, right? That's all sin. We don't need any more of God to overcome those things. He's already living inside of us. We've already got everything we need for life and godliness. The scripture just said it. It's not me. It's God telling you that. We already have what we need to grow spiritually spiritually. And that's exactly what God expects of us. So Christ didn't give his life in vain. He reached out to you. Gave, when he was on the cross, he reached out to you before you were born. And he said, I'm going to pay the price for Mark. 
And when I received Christ as a nine-year-old boy, there was an expectation that I was going to grow spiritually. Same expectation for you. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. It's the last scripture I'm going to use. This kind of describes the, the process almost in, in broad terms, I guess. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, all envy, and all evil speaking. So laying aside all the old behaviors so we can take on the nature of Christ. Laying aside all those things. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So it's natural for a baby to cry when they're hungry. They need that milk. That's an instinct that, that God has placed in them. They feel a hunger pain and they, they cry out. And when's the last time you cried out to God and said, God, I need to understand. God, I need more knowledge of you. I want a closer walk with you. It says as newborn babies, we should desire this closeness with God. The milk of the word. We should be desiring spiritual food. I, we watched a documentary one time, and it's a guy that for 30 days, he ate nothing but McDonald's. Oh, yeah. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If you haven't watched that, I, I asked him, I'm trying to remember the name. But it's interesting how bad his health was in one month. Because yeah. he ate McDonald's three meals a day. I, did he have snacks too? If he did, he was really messed up. But yeah, eat junk food, stuff that's not good for you. It hurts your health. Did y'all know that, by the way? I, I didn't know if you knew. You know what's a lot worse than that? Is feeding junk into your mind and your heart that ruins your spiritual health, that kills you spiritually, that separates you from God because you can't think on godly terms. You're thinking in terms of the world. And so we have to have this desire for God's Word. And by the way, what was the Word in New Testament times? I thought about that when I was studying they, he's, he's writing to the New Testament church. He's saying you should desire the sincere miracle of the word. What was the word at that time? They didn't have the Bibles. One written yet. What was the word? Hmm? Christ was the living word, but he was gone, right? The church has started. Yeah. So what happened is that Peter... And John and Paul and all those guys that wrote the New Testament books. These weren't books. These were letters to the churches. And it wasn't just a letter to the church. It was a letter from somebody who knew Jesus. In fact, it was a letter from somebody who had walked with Jesus physically on this earth. Now, if they uncovered a letter from somebody uh, that I knew, and I, I knew they had walked with Christ, and I never read that letter before, I would bring it here, and I would read it to you. Because that's important. Hey, they were with Jesus. Let's see what they got to say. Or if, if somebody that had been walking with Jesus suddenly came back to life and, and he was visiting the churches, I'd call and schedule because we need to hear somebody that's been with Jesus. Amen. And that's how they got their word, right? Because it wasn't written down for them the, they, the way it is for us. <clears throat> the funny thing about that is, and I don't have data to support this, but you know what I believe? I believe there was more of a desire for the word in the New Testament times than there is today. We have virtually unlimited and uninterrupted access to the word of God. Yet we don't have a desire to study the word of God. Now, I don't know if that's because we know so much and we're so smart or we don't realize how much we need to study the word. We need to have this desire to grow by reading the Word. So our desire for the Word seems to be our desire for the world seems to be much greater than our desire for the Word. And so we've got to receive somehow, receive it from God, a renewed concept of this purpose that why are we here? What are we called to do as a church? What are we called to do as individuals? We've got to have that renewed sense of purpose. And then we've got to commit to that brand new, afresh. You know, we had the Lord's 
Supper, and, and I told you we're, we're, we got a clean slate. And I know you're wondering what I wrote down in my Bible. I'm going to tell you what I wrote down in my Bible because if I don't write things down, I forget it. And I just thought about an old beat-up chalkboard that's been used so much. It's been written on and erased and written on and erased so many times. You ever seen a really worn-out looking chalkboard? Mm -hmm. That's what I look like. Mm -hmm. A worn-out looking chalkboard. Because I've asked for forgiveness so many times. And you know those old erasers that you never could get all the chalk dust out of them. Right? And for those that don't know what an eraser and chalkboard and all that is, ask your parents. But you never could get them clean. It was never perfect and it always left some chalk dust on the board. And when God wipes you clean, you're clean. And not only, you know, I had that thought about being an old worn out. No, I'm not. Because he made me brand new. And when he wipes the slate clean, it's like he put up a whole new chalkboard. And I'm thankful for that. We need to get that as a church. We need this renewal of desire to serve God and this renewal of, of this sense of purpose, this commitment. We're in the last days. The time is drawing nearer. It's nearer today than it was yesterday, being nearer tomorrow than it is today. We've got to have this sense of urgency. And I want to challenge you to do something. Um... Answer a couple of questions in your heart, first of all. Do we really want to be like Christ? If Christ was on the earth right now, would he be considered cool? Because I know how important it is to be cool. I'm not, but I know how important it is. It's really important. So, do we really want to be like Christ? Because that kind of separates us from the world. We wouldn't be like anybody else. Do we really want to bear fruit for God's kingdom or would we rather just keep going and building our own kingdom? We've got to answer those questions in our heart before we can move forward with spiritual growth. You know that. So, the challenge is, and, and the prayer is, God, renew our desire for godliness. Renew, renew our desire for a closer relationship with you. Renew our desire for prayer and study the word and this challenge is help me Lord to, to change me to be more like Christ and it's not just a closer walk with Jesus so we feel better not, so he'll answer our prayers faster I walk close to him he'll answer prayers faster that's not our prayers Lord I want to be more like Christ in my attitude I have a bad attitude sometimes I know you do too I've seen it just kidding I want to be more like Christ in my words. Because sometimes my words are automatically, I don't like to say negative. I, I don't think they're negative as much as skeptical. Ask her, she probably gets fed up with it pretty quick. Somebody presents something on TV, I don't believe that. That's just, it's an automatic reaction. Maybe that's a good thing, but, you know, our attitudes need to change. The way we treat others really needs to change. The way we treat each other inside the church, we need to treat each other as Christ would. And, and we're far from that. So the challenge is, God, renew my desire to be close to you. Renew my desire to study the word and know more about you. Lord, renew my desire to serve you. Make my desires godly desires. Lord, give me a lust. Lord, I need more lust for you. I need more lust for the things of the kingdom and a hatred for sin. Would you stand with me? So, over the next few weeks, unless the Lord changes things, over the next few weeks we're going to talk about spiritual growth. And we're going to get kind of specific on a few things. Because I think it's worth our while understand what God expects us to do, to understand what He promised He would do for us if we'll obey Him, and how He wants to use us to build His kingdom. I think that's really the whole purpose of us getting together. I love you guys, and I'm glad to be here. It's good to see all of you every time. I'll just say, it is. I'm okay with every one of you. You're all right. You know, you're not perfect. I understand that. I'm, I look in the mirror every day. I know what imperfection looks like, so I'm good. But I might 
just say, that's not the reason I come to church. I love you, but that's not why I'm coming to church. God has called us to serve Him. God has called us to reach out to others and evangelize, to be disciples of Christ. What we do in this building on Sundays is important. We've got to be focused. We've got to grow so that we can go out and share the gospel with others. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we know that the power of Christ has given us exceedingly great and precious promises. We know that you live on the inside of us. If we are saved, we have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. We've been forgiven of sin, and Lord, hopefully we, during the communion, we got this clean slate, and God, now you have this clean chalkboard to write your word on and to give us direction. God, I pray you give us the desire to follow you. You give us the desire to learn more about you and more about what we should be doing to build the kingdom. God, I pray that you give us the desire, Father, to just to be closer to each other, to know what unconditional love really is and to show that to everyone we see. God, I pray that folks would see Christ in us. Lord, that people be drawn closer to you by the way that we live our life and by the words that we say and the attitudes that we have. God, I pray that you change us. Help us become partakers of that divine nature. Help us to grow spiritually. Lord, if there's someone here who has something in their life that's keeping them separated from you, God, I pray that today will be the day to give that up. They repent of it. They walk away from it. Lord, if it's a problem that they're struggling with, that they would leave it at the foot of the cross. That if it's an attitude they have, that they drop that by the wayside and keep walking toward, toward Christ. Lord, if it's a need in their life, Lord, that you would meet that need according to your will and you would give them the patience to wait for that answer that belongs to them through you. God, whatever the need is, Lord, I pray that you would meet it today so that we might be partakers of the divine nature and we might be fruitful in the kingdom of God. Lord, on an individual basis and as a church body, make us more like Jesus this morning. Meet our needs, Father, according to your will. In Christ's name, amen. If you need to pray, you can offer. Praise and glory for it all, and I 
is healing up great for they did the surgery on that. Yeah. So we're very blessed. We count our blessings every day. Amen. Amen. That's good news. I have a prayer. Yes, sir. Look where I'm at this morning. Amen. We're glad that you're here too. Amen. It's good to see you guys. Amen. Thank you. Who else? So he's done with his family. And I don't know if you heard his story. You go ahead. Can you say again? Good report from the high doctor. Good report from the high doctor. I left my hearing aids at home, and I could not hear you, so sorry about that. So, who else? My grandfather has a birthday this week. Oh. And he is? He will be. He will be. Amen. Who else, real quick? I praise God for staying right here and helping to you. You got one. No, you got one. I've got a bunch. You're the one I'm thinking about. Oh, it's a tip. I got a, my sisters, like y'all have been praying for them for a long time, and uh, they called this morning. We're on our way to church again. Amen. And they have just really tied in to the uh, local church. And I just praise God for that because Amen. that's what they need. Yeah. They need to not only hear the word, they need to be surrounded with godly people that will be a support to them and pray for them and help them. And I'm just so thankful. So so two weeks ago, it was her, the one sister that went. And today, it's both of them going. So that's awesome. Yeah. God is working. Yeah. Well, I'm more yes, sir. The Zoom videos. Without them, we'd be lost. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the videos. We're glad that you Awesome. We appreciate Brother Pat doing all that heavy lifting for that every Sunday. Doesn't get old, does it, Pat? No. Okay. He's smiling when he said that, so he's still okay. But. Now, our little Tucker is, is healing good. Tucker is healing good. They've been trying to keep him away from like anything that will cause him to sneeze. Or cough, and of course the weather is awful because with the, everything he's got, all the stitching and stuff, they don't want him to sneeze and they don't want him to cough. And so, yeah. uh, hopefully, it might be a chance he'll be back next week. So, thank y'all for praying for him. He's doing really good. Awesome. And we're thankful for everybody being here this morning. Uh, really appreciate it, and uh, appreciate you supporting the church. And let's let's be thinking about uh, the challenge, asking God for that desire to be closer to him. You know, it, we, we can fill our lives up with whatever we decide to. Why not just make a decision to fill it up with God? Yeah. Let him be the first piece you put in and make sure that you're, every day that you're working on your spiritual growth. Why would you not do that? And, and I'm talking to me too. I get busy too and get tired and, and worn out. And it's hard to discipline yourself to do that every day. But if you'll do that, I guarantee you God is going to give you great reward for that. It's going to be a life-changing thing for you. So I want to challenge you for that. We're going to sing Happy Birthday real quick. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday, God bless you. Happy Birthday to you. Amen. Yes, sir. Anything else? And I totally forgot announcements. I'm sorry, Hunter. I know you look forward to that every Sunday. He's good, he says. Okay. All right. All right. Everybody done? Uh, we're going to close out in prayer. And Brother Randy Hodges, would you lead us, please? God, we love you. We thank you for another day that you've given us. Father, a day to enjoy, a day to feel your presence. We thank you for the message we've heard from the songs that have been sung, God. We pray that you might apply them to our lives. God, that we might ever be wanting to have and to be more like you. Uh, what's ever stood the remainder of this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Amen.